Hello everyone, today we'll be discussing the lumbar puncture procedure. So let's get started here. All right, so first we will be discussing the indications, contraindications, complications, pearls and pitfalls of performing a lumbar puncture. Um, and then we will proceed to discuss the model and the supplies that you will find when you come into the lab. And lastly, we are going to go through a step-by-step -step process of performing your lumbar puncture. So we will start off at the very beginning when you introduce your, uh, yourself to your patient, get your informed consent all the way down to where you give your patient post-procedure instructions, okay? And these steps are the steps that you can find on your rubric. All right, so the indications for a lumbar puncture um, are divided into whether it's for diagnostic purposes, therapeutic or uh, to support a suspicion of a diagnosis such as neurosyphilis, Guillain-Barre or multiple sclerosis. You will find that probably the more common indications are going to be in the case of like a meningitis um, or in the case of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. But of course, when you're suspecting a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you would want to get a negative CT scan first before proceeding with a lumbar puncture. Contraindications to a lumbar puncture. You have seen a couple of these uh, or a few of these before in some other procedures. So some of these might stick out to you, such as dermatitis or cellulitis at the insertion site. So um, for this uh, procedure, our, the area of interest is the lower back. So if we were to find a cellulitis in that lower back region, we, that would definitely keep us from performing a lumbar puncture. We don't want to be introducing that superficial infection into the deeper tissue and definitely not into the spinal region. All right, other common uh, uh, contraindications here are an, uh, if you have an uncooperative patient and if you have someone with a, a high bleeding risk. So in these cases though, if you had someone that for example, maybe had thrombocytopenia or maybe uh, was on anticoagulation therapy, you would definitely want to get a hematologist involved to make some of those calls, all right? Now, some of the contraindications that you probably have not uh, seen in some of the other procedures we've discussed in, in lecture and lab are going to be raised intracranial pressure. So in the cases that you're suspecting an elevated intracranial pressure, you definitely want to get a good neurologic exam, a good fundoscopic exam. And so if you were to find papilledema on your exam, um, you would want to get a, a CAT scan, all right? So get that CAT scan and, and that's going to help you identify if there's some sort of mass lesion going on or other causes uh, for that increase in intracranial pressure. All right, and lastly, a lumbosacral deformity is a relative contraindication. So um, oftentimes this is just a matter of planning, getting a good history from the patient, finding out exactly what's going on in that lumbar region, finding exactly what surgery the patient has had previously. Um, you know, if your patient has ankylosing uh, spondylitis or uh, kyphoscoliosis or, or something like that, um, just planning accordingly to see how you could have um, uh, a, su a successful lumbar puncture. Sometimes that entails using ultrasound or fluoroscopy guidance. Sometimes just changing uh, your interspace. So going one above or one below, if the one that you were planning on using is the one affected. Of course, you know, keeping in mind that the, that the spinal cord ends at about L1, L2, right? Um, and other things to keep in mind is position. So position of the patient can sometimes um, be changed. And, uh, and one more thing I wanted to add is, uh, let's just say, for example, a patient had uh, previous back surgery, um, like a laminectomy. So in the case of a laminectomy, there's no bone there. So actually you could use that space um, uh, as, your, as your designated space to perform your lumbar puncture, being that there's no bone there. All right, so that would be, that might be a case where there's previous back surgery that might work in your favor. All right, so pearls of a lumbar puncture. So first and foremost, positioning is key. All right, so position is going to be probably one of the most important things of, of being successful in your lumbar puncture. Now, um, when you are positioning your patient, you also want to look at your landmarks. So palpate your iliac crest. Uh, palpate your spinous processes and find the interspace that you want to use. 
once you identify your interspace, then you want to mark it. So listed here, they mention a marking pen or a retractable pen. You will see a little bit later that I use the hub of a needle. So either of these will leave a little indentation in the skin. Um, uh, well, not the marking pen, right? But the retractable pen or the hub of a needle will both leave a little indentation on the skin that you will be able to see after you have cleansed the, the region and you have prepped your supplies and ready to go. All right. Um, if you suspect that you are going to have a difficult procedure um, or you can't palpate your, your landmarks, then you could use ultrasound guidance or fluoroscopy. All right. So after you have done all that, and then you prepare, um, you open up your, your, your lumbar puncture tray, you get uh, your surgical gloves on, you'll prep your things in your tray and you'll want to cleanse the patient's skin. So you want to cleanse either with chlorhexidine or with povidone iodine. So this is based on uh, provider preference or if the patient has an allergy, all right? Next, we are going to talk about needles and the bevel of the needle. So first of all, this needle right here, this is uh, classified as a cutting needle. You'll notice the bevel is facing to one direction. So in this case, the bevel is facing you. It's facing, uh, facing out of your computer, laptop, iPad, whatever you are using. So it's facing towards you. All right. So the easiest thing to remember when performing a lumbar puncture is face your bevel towards the patient's flanks, okay? Remember that the patient can be positioned either upright or in lateral recumbent position or even prone. So um, dependent on what position the patient is in, it might get a little tricky to try and remember, okay, where am I facing my bevel? But if you just remember to face your bevel towards the flanks, that should be, that should be helpful. So the reason you want to point the bevel towards the flanks is going to be because you want to decrease the incidence of, um, of a post-procedure headache. Um, also, you want to decrease the incidence of spinal nerve root damage, all right? Now, the last thing I'll say about needles is uh, the, the comparison. So we said this is a cutting needle, and then we have these two over here that are classified as atraumatic needles. And so you'll notice the shape of these is different. So these are shaped like a pencil tip. All right, so these, um, there are pros and cons to your decision on what type of needle to use. So the pros to using an atraumatic needle, one of these, the pro is that um, there's a decrease in incidence of a postural puncture headache. Um, but the con is that there's a, there's a lower sensation of you feeling the pop when you go through that ligamentum flavum. So it's kind of, um, there's, you know, you have that, that decision to make the pro and the con. Um, the other, the other, the other thing to decide on that will decrease your incidence of a postural uh, puncture headache is using a smaller bore needle. So you'll notice right here, you notice right here that uh, it's saying a 22 gauge cutting needle. So one of these, but um, a 22 gauge versus using a 20 is a good compromise um, um, considering the factors of these, uh, of deciding what needle to use. All right. Okay, so when you are perform performing your lumbar puncture and inserting your needle, you are going to pass the epidermis, pass the dermis, pass the subcutaneous tissue here, what you see in yellow, your supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and then that ligamentum flavum is right here. So um, when you feel that pop, that sensation of a pop, uh, which is your ligamentum flavum, you are either in your subarachnoid space or you're, you're very close, okay? So when you feel that pop, you probably want to remove your stylet and check for CSF return. If you don't see any, then put your stylet back in, advance a, a, a couple of millimeters and then try again. So remove your stylet again and check again. When you do that, make sure you hold on just a couple of seconds when you're checking for CSF return. Sometimes it doesn't happen immediately. 
All right. So um, now let's just say you've tried a couple of times or that you, you start, you encounter bone. Okay. So if that were to happen, then you want to withdraw your needle and redirect. Now you're not going to withdraw your needle. Here's the needle, right? You're not going to withdraw the needle all the way out of the skin. You're going to withdraw the needle probably to about the subcutaneous tissue. And then you want to redirect your needle. And the reason for that is because you don't want to just change, um, uh, just redirect your needle when it's, when it's this far in, because you'll damage the tissue um, by doing that. All right. Um, okay, so we mentioned replacing the stylet. You don't want to be moving your, your needle around without the stylet inside. And then lastly, down here, if you need to obtain an opening pressure, all right, you want to set up your manometer when setting up your supplies in your trade. And um, here are the normal values, okay, of an opening pressure that you want to be looking for. And then the fluid. So when you perform, uh, when you are obtaining your opening pressure, the fluid will rise in your manometer. And so that fluid, you don't want to discard that fluid. Um, that CSF is precious. So when you're collecting into your four collection tubes, that will be what goes into your, your first collection tube, okay? All right, pitfalls. So pitfalls being things that you want to avoid, things you don't wanna do when performing a lumbar puncture. First of all, um, uh, forced flexion of the neck. So especially in infants and small children, you don't wanna cause any cardiorespiratory issues. Next, positioning. Again, position, position, position is uh, important. Um, I already mentioned that you want to give the CSF a couple of seconds to flow when you remove your stylet. It doesn't always happen immediately. And um, down here, so when you are going to be um, acquiring an opening pressure, um, you want to do this when the patient is in lateral recumbent position. Okay, so if you already know ahead of time you need that opening pressure, then you want to make sure you position your patient in a lateral recumbent whenever possible so you can get an accurate measurement. And another thing you want to do is have the patient at that point relax their legs. All right, and then lastly, um, order your tubes. Okay, so when you set up your supplies on your tray, you want to put your tubes in order. That way that can, uh, you can easily identify and label your tubes after the procedure. All right, so lastly, we have complications of a lumbar puncture. So um, the most common one, or the one of the more common ones that we've been talking about is that postural puncture headache, okay? So that headache, unfortunately, um, is common, and it's thought to be due to the leakage of CSF from the dura, all right? So that's definitely something uh, you want to keep an eye out for after the procedure. The, more, uh, the most dangerous complication is going to be cerebral herniation, okay? So during an, L, uh, an LP, a lumbar puncture, the, uh, basically there's a lower pressure caudally. And so this causes the intracranial contents to shift down the pressure gradient. And so that's why a cerebral herniation is um, a risk for a lumbar puncture procedure. And so that's the most dangerous one. And you want to, um, that's definitely something you don't want your patient to have. Other complications are going to be implantation of epidermoid tumors, aspiration of a nerve root into the spinal space, um, an infection. So if you introduce an infection into the spinal region, and then lastly, radicular pain and back pain. All right, so now let's go ahead and um, now let's go ahead and um, discuss the, the model that you will find when you come into the lab, as well as the, the tray, the lumbar puncture tray that you will have and everything that comes in it. So now let's talk about what you will see when you come into the lab. So you will have a lumbar puncture kit, which is what you see here in this tray. Um, you will also need to get a pair of sterile gloves and then you will have your lumbar puncture model that you see right here. Um, unfortunately, the model that I have already has lots of holes poked in here, but uh, hopefully when you come in, we will have brand new skins for you. The model that you see is set up to have some liquid, so you should see some liquid return when you perform the lumbar puncture and you do get into your correct spot. Um, you also get to appreciate 
the iliac crest, okay, which is our landmark, right? So we can actually palpate right here. You can palpate the iliac crest. This model, you can turn it to be upright, okay? So you can do the procedure upright or in lateral recumbent position. So either way that you choose is okay. Of course, in real life, if you wanted to do monom monometry and acquire an opening pressure, you would want the patient in lateral recumbent position so you get an, if, um, an accurate reading, okay? For uh, the demo in a little bit, I will be doing it in lateral recumbent position. Now, as far as what comes in your tray, in your kit here, you will have a fenestrated drape. Okay, that's this right here. I'm gonna set that aside. Now, um, you will see that one of the first things you do once you're, once you're doing your, once you're performing your procedure is you will set up everything in here. That way it's ready to go. Um, so I'll show that to you during the demonstration. But for now, I want to talk to you about what you will find here. So you will have your four tubes, your four collection tubes. These are numbered, okay? So they do have a number on them from one to four. And when you do set up your supplies, you will want to order them from one to four, okay? One, two, three, and four in that order. That way you know you collect in that particular order, okay? Um, you also have, let's start off with our spinal needle, okay? So you have a spinal needle. This particular kit, I believe, I believe this particular kit comes with a 22 gauge spinal needle. Notice this is a cut, a cutting tip, okay, so like a quinky. Um, you will notice that when we talk about this in lecture, there's other types of spinal needles like a Sprott or a Whitaker, and those are um, non-cutting. Those are atraumatic needles that are preferred in certain cases and are shown to reduce the incidence of post-dural procedural headache, okay, which is one of the most common complications that, that we talked about earlier. Um, so this was a cutting though, and that's, this is usually what comes in these kits. Next we have the manometer, okay, so if you were going to be needing to collect uh, CSF for your opening pressure, here's your manometer, you would put this together and connect this to your three-way stopcock here, okay? That turns to allow you the fluid to rise up, or when you're ready to collect your CSF, then you would turn it so that way the, the fluid can collect into your tube here. Let's pull one out of it, okay? So like that. All right, so for, the, for, the, for your practical though, you won't be collecting, um, you won't be measuring an opening pressure. All right, next we have your lidocaine, okay, so your anesthetic, and you have a small needle. This needle is for your intradermal and sub-Q um, injection of your anesthetic. And then you also have another needle, okay? This is for your deeper infiltration of anesthetic, all right? So that is here. Um, and you have your sponge sticks, all right? So these are for your cleansing of the site. Um, your assistant will likely pour in your iodine or whatever cleansing solution you will be using in a little this little pocket here. Um, and then you can just um, uh, apply some on the sponge stick and then onto your patient, all right? You have a Band-Aid, you have some gauze, and that is pretty much it. So that's what's on here. Of course, you would also need your sterile gloves. You need to find your appropriate size and that way you have a well-fitted size of gloves. All right, let's go on to the demonstration. Okay, so first you are going to introduce yourself to your patient, let them know your full name, let them know who you are. Um, and then you are going to verify your patient name and date of birth. So you want to make sure this is the right patient that you want to be performing a lumbar puncture on. And then you are going to acquire your, your informed consent. So you want to let them know your suspected diagnosis um, and why you're proposing this procedure. In this case, if we were suspecting meningitis, we want to get a sample of cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid around the spinal cord. You would you know, educate your patient on this and let them know uh, this cerebrospinal fluid will give us a good idea of what's going on 
if there is a meningitis, what type of meningitis, and the effective treatment. And so with this information, we can adequately treat the infection and in, in a timely manner, and so therefore have a good prognosis. Now, the risks and benefits of the procedure would be we could have infection, we could have bleeding, we could have a postural puncture headache, which is the most common. Um, the benefits, like I already said, we can treat this appropriately and in a timely manner. Alternative treatment options, there really aren't any good ones other than maybe just giving antibiotics uh, without uh, give, having that guidance of the lumbar puncture. Um, and risk of refusing altogether is um, that we can, again, we can give antibiotics, but unfortunately the, the patient could worsen and, um, and not do any better from their current state. All right, so once you do all that, you're, go you're going to gather your supplies. So you have your lumbar puncture tray, you have, you're going to get your sterile gloves. All right, so I'm, I've gathered my supplies. Now I'm going to position my patient. So in this case, I'm going to be performing the lumbar puncture with the patient in lateral decubitus position. I'm going to make sure patient is comfortable. I'm gonna make sure I'm comfortable. And so I'm going to have my uh, stool, or in this case, I have a chair, but you want the patient's side to be at about eye level. Okay, so you can adjust the bed if needed. Um, these beds don't adjust, but in the real world you could. All right, so I want to get familiar with this patient's uh, landmarks. So after I've put them in position and they're comfortable, remember you can always uh, provide pillows to, um, to adjust their position as well as make them more comfortable. Okay, so pillows are, are a plus. Um, you want to palpate for your landmark. So I'm going to palpate my iliac crest here. So you can actually, I, I think I already mentioned in the previous uh, part, that you can palpate the iliac crest and you are going to make your imaginary line. I'm going to use the hub of a needle and I'm going to make my indentation. It's obviously not going to stay on this skin, but on a real patient, you would have your indentation there. All right, so after I have um, done that, patient is in position. I have my landmark marked. Next, I'm going to go wash my hands, okay? So I'm going to wash my hands and then I'm going to proceed to um, opening my tray. Okay, so you have your tray, you have your sterile gloves. I'm going to open, there's usually a flap, and in this case it's hidden in here, but that flap is what you use to just grab the flap. This flap here, you see that little triangle? So you wanna open that up, maintaining sterility. So you do not want to touch anything inside until you have your sterile gloves on. All right, so now I have this open. I'm going to place my sterile gloves. I am also going to, at this time, I would have also put on my mask and my gown before applying my sterile gloves. Okay. So I'm going to use this space here. This is not the best space to put on my sterile gloves, but I'm doing it so you can see. And let me just open this here. Okay, so now you are sterile. Now you are going to prepare everything on your tray. You want everything to be ready. So 
you are going to open your tubes, leave them ready for you to just grab. You want them, you want to make sure they're in order. One, two, three, four. You're not going to use your manometer. All right, you want to prep your for your anesthetic. So you would break the vial and you would acquire your anesthetic here. It's two mLs. All right, so I have my anesthetic ready. I have the needle I'm going to switch to inject anesthetic deeper. And I have my uh, sponge sticks ready. I have, this is the drape and all. Okay, so we already, we basically already talked about all this, right? So I'm going to cleanse the patient. Concentric circles, I'm applying iodine and I'm going to toss that. Once you've cleansed the area, you're going to apply the fenestrated drape. There's an adhesive here that you would remove and apply like so, okay? Um, if it begins to get in the way, I'll probably just remove it but there it is for now. All right, and anything else that you have not prepared, make sure you do so. You could also use this if you wanna place this under your patient, but I already had uh, something there. Okay, so now I'm going to move forward with the anesthetic. My spinal needle is here ready. All right, so remember I cleanse the area so I can wipe off some of the excess here. Okay. Now I'm going to do an intradermal first. So I'm going to create my wheel. Switch my needle. <clears throat> and now for this part remember your remember where you're going so my iliac crest since i don't have an indentation i know where my iliac crests are i know where my umbilicus is and i'm going to uh, use a 15 degree angle from perpendicular So I want to inject my anesthetic in that same pathway that I'm going to insert my spinal needle. I'm going to aspirate and I'm going to inject. All right, so that's done. Okay. Now I'm ready to proceed with inserting my spinal needle. So uh, stylet is in place, bevel towards the flank. So the flank is here. So I'm going to point it towards the flank. I'm gonna use um, this, this uh, two-handed technique. You can also use this two-handed technique, but I prefer this one. All right, so bevel towards the flanks and just one more time, since I don't have my, my skin indentation, just palpating for my landmark here, my iliac crest. Now, one, one more thing I wanna add is look at, the, look at my needle. It needs to be parallel to the floor. Um, a lot of times you may notice that you're like this. And if you're noticing that your needle is not parallel to the floor, that, that might be a problem and you're not going to get into the right space. So you wanna be parallel. So you're inserting, you're passing epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue. Um, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and you're going to feel that pop for the ligamentum flavum. I felt that pop.
And so there's my CSF. So at that point, you can either use your thumb to stop the flow or you can place your stylet back. Have your first tube ready. You're gonna collect your first tube, second tube, you're gonna um oops you're going to collect the correct amount for each remember to collect in the right order replace your stylet okay you're going to remove your needle in a smooth motion At this time, you can remove your drape. You're going to wipe the skin, clean off that iodine. You don't want it to irritate the skin, so you clean that off. And you go ahead and place your Band-Aid. Okay, and you're done with the procedure, and so now you can um, have the patient lay down in a comfortable, a more comfortable position, and you're going to dispose of all your materials, throw the sharps in the sharps, remove your sterile gloves. Okay, and then you will discuss post procedure with your patient. So you can let them know, um, they can ambulate immediately, let them know in 12 to 24 hours, they can remove the band aid. When they do, they want to check for any leakage. So if they can't see very well, have someone do it for them and check their back, check for leakage. Um, if they have any leakage, they need to let you know. Um, if they have a, a headache, they can take analgesics. They need to rest. They can maybe try some caffeine. Um, but if that headache does not go away within 24 hours, then they need to come back and let you know. And um, that's pretty much it.